Good morning and welcome to today's uh, webinar on safeguarding. Safeguarding is something that obviously is a key priority for us all when we're at schools at all times and it can't be um, sort of understated just how important it's going to be going forward as well. I think given the current climate there's going to be lots and lots of challenges that we're going to face in all schools as a fallout of obviously this pandemic and I think if uh, for those of you that tuned in on Tuesday you'll sort of be aware of some of the additional work and some of the additional uh, challenges that our students are going to face. So I think it's probably a really sort of relevant time to look at some of the bits and pieces that we can do to make sure that safeguarding for, for all of us um, is a key priority and one that we kind of is at the forefront of our minds, not just this year over summer, but equally as we go into September. Twitter takeover today at Chilton TSA is Erin Corder. She'll be picking up any questions, any parts that you might want to sort of tweet out there. So I'm going to not hold us up anymore. We'll jump straight into the video from, as I say, Simon Turner, Simon Turner, Rabbi Chowdhury, and Abid Khan talking about safeguarding. My name is Abid Khan. Currently, I'm an associate assistant head teacher and designated safeguarding lead at Chorney High School for Boys. A fully comprehensive secondary school based in Luton, led by our head teacher, Mr. Daniel Connor. As you will appreciate, safeguarding contains a multitude of layers and obviously cannot be delivered in a single session. However, despite the time constraints, our focus today will be around creating and maintaining safeguarding cultures. Outstanding schools do not view safeguarding as a bolt on. Outstanding schools ensure that a culture of safeguarding runs deep through its veins within every single layer, around every single corner. The issue of safeguarding is key. It must be part of the school's DNA, so we all work together to keep every student and staff member safe. Safety is always at the forefront of everything. In this section, I will explore the ways in which an organization can create a safeguarding culture by sharing some of the strategies we employ here at Choni High School for Boys a school which has been judged outstanding recently and has been since 2002. My colleague Rabia Chowdhury will share some practical advice aimed at staff to ensure that we do not leave ourselves vulnerable. And then finally, my colleague Simon Turner will look at safeguarding implications post COVID-19. So what comes to mind when you hear the phrase safeguarding? Have a think. Is it about promoting the welfare of young people? Is it about protecting them from maltreatment? Is it about ensuring that they grow up in circumstances consistent with the provision of safe and effective care? Let's set the scene by taking a trip down memory lane, all the way back to 1996, when one of the greatest movies was released, Matilda. Do you remember it? Of course you do. Give me that book. Here's Pi. How old is Matilda? Four. I'm six and a half, Mommy. Five, then. I was six in August. You're a liar. I want to go to school. <laughs> school? It's out of the question. Who would be here to sign for the packages? We can't leave valuable packages sitting out on the doorstep. Now go watch TV like a good kid. <laughs> Honestly, I never get bored of this movie. My nephews and nieces force me to watch it every single week. Okay, so maybe they don't force me, but I do like the movie. The problem is I used to enjoy it so much before I became a safeguarding lead. When you watch the movie again, with your safeguarding hat on, things seem very different. Miss Trunchbull is an obvious safeguarding concern who needed an emergency visit by Ofsted and every single social service out there. She was a danger to everyone around her, including poor Bruce, who was forced to eat that chocolate cake. But there were others too. 
Miss Honey is not an obvious one at first glance, but she too needed protection. Protection from Miss Trunchbull, but also from Matilda who she was trying to save from Miss Trunchbull and her parents who were so neglectful. Miss Honey put herself in many vulnerable positions throughout this movie when trying to help Matilda. She was alone with her on many occasions, which would raise an eyebrow or two for us in schools. Now, if that story was true, we would undoubtedly report a catalogue of safeguarding errors. The school was clearly in need of a safeguarding culture. We will return to Matilda at the end of this webinar. Let's turn our attentions back to the original questions. What is safeguarding? Is it about promoting the welfare of young people? Is it about protecting them from maltreatment? Is it about ensuring that they grow up in circumstances consistent with the provision of safe and effective care? It is all of the above. You will of course recognise these snippets from Ofsted's safeguarding policy guidance. According to the NSPCC, safeguarding is the action taken to promote the welfare of children, preventing harm to children's health or development, ensuring children grow up with the provision of safe and effective care, and taking action to enable all children and young people to have the best possible outcomes. So how do you create a safeguarding culture? Safeguarding cultures do not appear overnight. You must guide your school's approach with effective strategies and clear leadership. An interesting tool worth exploring is the McKinsey 7S framework, which is an approach to understanding organisations and cultures. At the centre of this framework, we have our school's shared values, which are key drivers in creating any culture, and this includes safeguarding. We have strategy, structure, systems, styles, staff and skills. Strategy. We know that safeguarding is bound by legislation, procedures, protocols and guidance, like keeping children safe in education and safer recruitment, for example. An organisation which seeks to create a culture for safeguarding must be underpinned by effective strategy. This helps us set direction, it ensures cohesiveness, informs decision making and ensures we are all singing of the same sheet. A safeguarding strategy captures the range of safeguarding requirements and also reflects the contextual safeguarding issues which will be unique to your setting. At Choney High School for Boys, a school which serves an overwhelming majority of BAME students from an EAL background in one of the most deprived wards of the UK. Our strategy has to support our cohort. I stress the word our because your cohort will be different. So it's important to take this into consideration. This requires us to work closely with local community organisations so we understand what our students face when they leave our school gates. For example, one of our strongest assets is our parents. Attendance at parents' evenings runs over 80% and this in itself reflects the extent to which parents and carers care for their children. Over the last few years, we have continued to develop a strategy to further improve parental engagement. Our parents want to learn. We were so pleased when recently we discovered an online safeguarding course shaped just for parents. Within minutes of making this offer to them through parent mail, at least 10 had signed up to learn more about online safeguarding. They were so keen to know more, we also recorded an important e-safety safeguarding video on our school's YouTube channel in a number of languages to help overcome potential language barriers. This video aims to support you in keeping your children safe online. There is also a version available in Urdu and another version available in Bangla if that would be helpful. This video say hamara maqsad hai ke aapke bacche internet par mehfooz rahe. Hame pata hai ke aajkal aapke bacche internet ka istemal zyada kar rahe hain jisse kafi nuksan bhi ho sakta hai. Hello, amar naam Mr. Hub. Choni High School for Boys pokkar theke ek ta important message. Message ta holo bachcha der ke ki korum nirapod rakha jaye online. To make all this work, you need a structure. Ask yourself, do students and staff know who is in the safeguarding team? Do they understand the reporting structure in place? At Choni, this is made extremely clear. Information about safeguarding is everywhere. It's in student planners, on the walls of each classroom, in the toilets, around the corridors, everywhere. Though the designated safeguarding lead must be an appropriate senior member of staff, 
we must remember that safeguarding is everyone's responsibility. How is this notion understood in terms of the connection to governors, the head teacher or SLT? Does the safeguarding team have sufficient authority when working alongside teachers and other stakeholders? Systems like record keeping and training. Record keeping is an integral part of safeguarding. Good record keeping is an important part of a school's accountability to children and their families and will assist the DSLs in meeting their key responsibilities to respond appropriately to welfare concerns of children. Records should be factually accurate, relevant and up to date. At Chawney High School for Boys, we use CPOMs to record all safeguarding concerns. It's important to embed a culture of internal and external quality assurance. We benefit from regularly auditing our CPOMs entries. If everyone in your setting is responsible, then everyone must be trained. There is no compromise with this. We use the child protection company for some of our staff training. Questions worth asking are, is your child protection policy up to date? Is it used? Is it effective? How do you know? Do staff have access to safeguarding knowledge, resources and training? Can you show evidence of staff training? Is your recording structured, clear, factual and written professionally? Are you happy for your records to be shared in the court of law if need be? Do you use your records to improve safety and welfare of students? Let's now look at styles in terms of leadership. The attention to safeguarding by school leaders always determines the extent to which a culture of vigilance is being maintained throughout the school. The Education Inspection Framework Handbook says, when safeguarding is ineffective, this is likely to lead to an inadequate leadership and management judgment. The quality of safeguarding is closely linked to the effectiveness of leadership and management. A school leadership's reflective practice will shape views on whether staff truly believe that it could happen here. It's extremely important to have a listening culture so that staff and students are confident about coming forward with their concerns. In order to protect students, they must have a voice. Confidence in the system and an understanding of safeguarding issues. Here are a few questions to ask yourself. Does safeguarding feature across your curriculum? Do you talk about contextual safeguarding and issues that affect your particular setting? How is safeguarding fully owned at governance and senior leadership levels? Do you understand your safeguarding culture? Where is it strong and where it needs attention? What are your key goals? How are leaders shaping and influencing practice towards these? Staff and skills. Do your staff have sufficient time to become familiar with the range of safeguarding procedures? Do you ring fence time to focus on safeguarding? Do staff fully understand the policies they sign? Staff must understand what's in these statutory guidance documents. Signing it when a new addendum is released is simply a tick box and that doesn't work. Keeping children safe in education 2020, which comes into play this September, has 119 pages from beginning to end. The emphasis on implementation and impact rather than simply intent is clear in the inspection framework. Staff must be able to apply this knowledge to identify young people at risk of harm and take the right action to keep them safe. This presents a challenge to DSLs to ensure their knowledge is sufficient around each subject and to design relevant and timely CPD for their teams. How confident are staff at your school? Creating opportunities for staff to practice their safeguarding skills is one way to build confidence, such as through scenario-based discussions. This also supports the opportunity to review the quality of practice and refine your approaches. It's interesting that during our recent Ofsted visit, inspectors were very keen to know how we knew staff understood guidance. We were confidently able to answer these questions because we map out training before the start of the academic year and we build in time for more training when new policies and addendums are released. We often plan safeguarding quizzes to ensure this information is stored in long-term memory. We didn't do it because of Ofsted. We did it because it was the right thing to do. But those staff quizzes did come in handy. The reality is that with everything going on around us, sometimes, as staff members, we forget ourselves. We have to not only be aware of how to safeguard students, 
but we as staff are also very important. I will now like to introduce my colleague Rabia Chowdhury for her insights into safeguarding ourselves. Good morning. I hope you're all well. My name is Rabia and I work alongside Avid here at the school and Simon, who you'll hear from later. I'd like to share with you a safeguarding tool to help you review your existing online presence and to ensure you stay safe online as professionals whilst working within education. We have now been plunged deeper than ever before into the digital world in an attempt to re-establish some continuity. Similarly to maintaining high standards of safeguarding during the pre-COVID era, it's important to regularly assess risks within this new space which we find ourselves occupying for extended periods of time. The space being the internet, social media and the online world in general. We're now plugged in longer than ever before with screen time rocketing to unprecedented heights. Tether to our phones, laptops and tablets, what do we need to consider? Let's begin. To start, let's borrow the SAFE acronym. You'll easily remember the following four steps aligned to staying safe. But first, let's take a look at what's happening here. What do you see? A group of people, unwinding, relaxing perhaps? How about now? Do any of these titles mean anything to you? Yes, it could quite possibly be an end of year staff social, with staff taking a break from all the planning and marking they've been doing throughout the year. For most, perhaps the scene causes you to become reminiscent of the housing days before COVID-19. Of course, it's important to maintain positive relationships with those whom you work with, but how often do we become complacent? When was the last time you accepted a friend request from a colleague online without speaking to them about connecting in that way first? How often have you shared a photo or comment via WhatsApp which potentially blurs the lines of professional conduct? Or accidentally sent a personal message to a work group chat? Whilst in some cases these incidents are seemingly innocuous, in others it could easily place you and others in an incredibly vulnerable position. Back to staying safe. Step one, spring clean your online presence. We share this world with not only our family and friends, but with students, parents, and our colleagues. Investigate yourself through search engines and establish what details, both private and public, are accessible to others. Consider what your digital footprint represents. It's likely you'll find outdated information which you may need to review, amend, or possibly even remove. Scan YouTube and social media platforms for any uploads or accounts you perhaps were not aware of. You may be surprised as to what you uncover. Step number two, assess. On the back of Googling yourself, revisit your online settings. Check your existing privacy settings or any media accounts. Check your friendship links, your profile pictures and any historical posts or content uploaded. It's advisable to use a billboard principle as an indicator. If you would be unhappy for particular information to be shared on a public billboard, you need to ensure it is not readily available for others to access online. Step three, future proof. Moving forward, only ever accept friend requests from those whom you've spoken to in person about connecting online. Students spend most of their lives online and with great ease can create convincing profiles. This will prevent any breaches in your private world online and significantly reduce their temptation to exploit a loose end. It's important to never underestimate your individual contribution to the overall safeguarding culture at your school. Lastly, step four, evaluate your own emotional well-being. We know online platforms are designed to spike our dopamine levels. Author Tanya Goodin writes extensively on how we interact with technology and how our relationship with our devices impact us as people. Consider designing your own digital detox. Analyze your time spent online. Screen time checks are readily available on almost all Android and iPhones. You may be surprised to see how your productivity compares to time spent on social media. Think about blue light emissions. We know how this impacts sleep. Again, most smartphones allow you to change settings on your phone to have this automatically timed or completely switched off. Airplane mode can work just as well for you to connect to the real world surrounding you. How do you manage your emails? Making a conscious effort to structure time for these may allow you to reclaim the pace of your life. Author and transformational leader Dr. Kapowski also provides many strategies to implement some of the above changes in his book, Manage Your Time or Your Time Will Manage You. Interestingly, studies inform us time and time again 
that by implementing these small changes, you're able to hack your productivity. Not necessarily turning 24 hours miraculously into 25, but potentially allowing you to reclaim otherwise lost hours of scrolling through websites or emails, or even reducing your risk of falling down a YouTube rabbit hole. New York-based professor Adam Adler explores the power of stopping queues. How often have you found yourself losing track of time whilst browsing the internet? Whether it's in search of a particular style bike helmet or recipes you'll never attempt in a million years. Sites are designed to deliver never-ending sources of interest, utilising cookies to hook you in and keep you there. It is essentially the absence of stopping queues which place you on this continuum uninterrupted. Speaking of cookies, essentially it is the equivalent of opting for this as opposed to this. With one cookie, you have the opportunity to stop once it's gone. However, should you choose to continue on, on your conscious being. Let's pause for thought. Can you remember a time when your phone was not in arm's reach? Writer and social nomic specialist Eric Corman provides some insightful statistics on the back of recent studies. Number one, if social media platforms were considered nations alongside countries, Facebook would count as the largest in terms of population size. Number two, approximately 53% of millennials would rather lose their sense of smell than technology. And lastly, there are now more people in the world who now own a phone than own a toothbrush. Ultimately, let's take it back to the acronym and remember to stay safe. Spring clean, assess, future proof and consider your emotional well-being. Thank you for listening. So the key messages from Rabia were spring clean your online presence and be very mindful of the digital footprints we leave behind. Thank you Rabia. Now let's think ahead. During the COVID-19 pandemic, we've all had to adapt and change our approaches as educators and safeguarding leads. Like most schools, everyone was taken unaware by the arrival of COVID, but more so its devastating impact and the length of its stay. As a school, we put in place several measures to support and safeguard our students. For example, some of these resources that we produced as a school and shared on our school website and Twitter pages and ensured that these messages were passed on to parents as well. I would now like to introduce my colleague Simon Turner who will share more of the strategies we've used during this pandemic and suggest some possibilities for after COVID-19. Good morning, my name is Simon Turner and I'm the designated Deputy Safeguarding Lead at Chorney High School for Boys. Having heard from Abid regarding safeguarding culture and from Rabia talking of advice around social media, I would like now to focus your thoughts on what safeguarding might look like when we return to school in September. COVID-19 will still be here. Who knows how schools will be functioning? At this moment in time, despite guidance and opinion, we simply do not know with any absolute certainty what September and school will look like. Will all students be back at the same time? Will some students still be home learning? Will some families decide not to send their children back? What are the legalities around this? What is the moral understanding around this? What stance will your school or establishment take? For all the guidance and planning, there will almost certainly be other Leicesters with localised lockdowns or restrictions. But let us hope our towns and communities will not be the next one. It's not just the safeguarding leads that need to be thinking ahead. All staff will have a key role to play in managing our students. As the Keeping Children Safe in Education document states, safeguarding is everyone's responsibility. This is something that definitely won't be changing in September. Before thinking ahead, it will be helpful to focus on the present. What have you and your respective establishments been doing to maintain effective safeguarding during lockdown? At Chorney High School for Boys, we have had a comprehensive system in place, planned for prior to lockdown and implemented from day one. Lists were compiled of vulnerable students, taken from all areas of vulnerability, such as any child who was on child protection or child in need or early help, students with additional social or learning needs, looked after children, students with known emotional vulnerabilities, not necessarily under any other agency, 
and students under CAMH. And this is not an exhaustive list. Specific staff were tasked with maintaining regular contact with these children, weekly, fortnightly, whatever was felt most appropriate. Close contact has been maintained with existing social workers and other partner agencies to ensure a joined up approach and timely sharing of knowledge or concerns. The list has been, and remains, a fluid working document to add to and remove from as circumstances dictate. But it's not just the children that have deserved our thoughts and attention. Our staff are equally as vital to the well-being of the school, so we have tried to be supportive and available for our staff at all times. This has been achieved through a variety of means, such as weekly briefings, regular reference and signposting to well-being and mental health resources, rolled out mandatory COVID-19 updated safeguarding training, availability of the senior leadership team and the safeguarding team at all times to receive and assist with concerns, phone calls or advice to staff when support is needed. A whole staff wellbeing survey has been rolled out to gauge the general mood, feelings and concerns of our staff and to learn lessons should there be another lockdown in the future. As a school, as a senior leadership team, as heads of year, house or department, as teaching staff, support staff in and out of the classroom, safeguarding leads, deputies, as designated teachers or support, what do you truly know about your children? The majority of whom, come September, you will not have had any direct contact or involvement with for maybe six months. Reflect for a moment, please. What has your school or establishment been doing during lockdown to maintain meaningful, regular contact with your children? Has setting work been enough or has there been a sub-layer of contact operating as described previously? Has your focus purely been on vulnerable lists and key worker children? Is there an argument that being disadvantaged has potentially for some children become an advantage? Is the opposite true? In relation to a child's mental health and well-being, do you know which of your families have suffered bereavements, linked to COVID or otherwise? The big question, and perhaps only time will tell, is what will these children or families' needs actually be? As a school, we have circulated bereavement awareness training to all our staff and have staff within the pastoral team trained to a higher level. But will this be enough? Do we need to be considering buying in professional help over and above the existing avenues with CAMH, early help, chums, etc.? Theoretically, could we, indeed should we, be submitting multiple safeguarding referrals under the emotional neglect category for any child whose parents or carers have allowed them to do no learning at all for the last six months? I think we would all agree this is clearly unrealistic, but the frightening reality is that many parents, and here we are not judging, simply do not have the appropriate mental health or counselling skills to help themselves, let alone their children. What will school need to do? Because we know that early help, social care, CAMH, etc., will just not have capacity. There is more and more opinion and evidence being published and circulated by varying agencies and individual experts concerning the effect that the pandemic has and will have on our children and their families. On the 9th of April, the Children's Society published some following information. They state that currently one in eight children aged five to 19 have a diagnosable mental health condition. They are concerned that COVID-19 may result in heightened feelings of anxiety and worry and could exacerbate low mood and other mental health conditions. With schools closed, for most young people are directly experiencing social distancing high levels of isolation and wider dislocation. They will also be exposed to endless news stories and social commentaries about the virus. From their good childhood research, they state that young people worry about society and global issues, and they are expecting levels of worry to be high during the crisis. The impact that COVID-19 might have on family members or carers who are older or vulnerable could have significant impact on a child's well-being. On the 14th of June, an article on BBC News was posted concerning child psychologists highlighting mental health risks during the lockdown. The key points in this article were the isolation of lockdown is harming already vulnerable young people. Mental health problems such as anxiety were already rising in young people before lockdown. 
evidenced that growing feelings of loneliness and social isolation as a result of school closures during the pandemic could be making that worse, especially amongst teenagers. When many of this cohort enter adulthood, we will be deep in recession, so they will need mental resilience and educational preparedness. We are potentially damaging both with lifelong consequences for them and society. Perhaps the most damning statistic that I heard recently, so much so that I had to look it up to check that I'd heard correctly, is from Bernardo's, and this was posted on the 22nd of June. In isolation, for me, this shows the potential detriment to the emotional well-being and mental health of our children that this pandemic could leave as its legacy. Bernardo's declare a state of emergency as the number of children needing foster care during coronavirus pandemic has risen by 44%. And people looking to become foster parents, that number has plummeted by nearly half compared to the same period last year. In summary, my input today has been designed to provoke thought, not necessarily provide fail-safe solutions. We do not yet know with any absolute certainty what September will look like, but we can be prepared. To be blunt, it would be negligent not to be. There is no excuse not to be. Safeguarding needs or concerns will not have changed, but they may be more complex. Bereavement within immediate or extended family, home or abroad, will be relevant and have a significant role to play with our children's mental health and well-being. Staff too will need support through the transition back to normality and should not be forgotten. Safeguarding practices will have to adapt and evolve in the face of whatever September looks like, but please don't panic. We will all be in the same boat. Therefore, talking to one another and sharing best practice will never have been so important. The new norm will be what it will be. It will be for us to embrace it, work with it, and continue to support our children and staff to the same standards that we have always done. Thank you all for your time today, and I hope you have taken something from our respective deliveries. Thank you, Simon. That's a timely reminder to ensure that when we do return to school, we must be mindful of the different ways in which this pandemic might have impacted students' lives and the lives of our staff. I hope you found some key ideas to hang on to or develop within your teams. You'll remember our acronym SAFE from the outset. Safety is always at the forefront of everything. Now let's revisit Matilda. Remember the McKinsey framework? The seven S's for developing a safeguarding culture. Shared values, structure, systems, style, staff, skills and strategy. Audit your existing processes and procedures. Are they tailored to your specific setting? Take time to check your own media profiles and be mindful of the digital footprint we leave behind. Include safeguarding within your whole school curriculum where possible. Liaise with your DSL or safeguarding team whenever you are unsure of something. Develop healthy and professional relationships with staff and students. Always look for the good in others and support them to do the same. Thanks everyone, have a great week and let's continue to keep everyone safe. Okay, thank you. A fantastic presentation where it kind of really highlights the fact that there's just so much within the realms of safeguarding. Um, and as with a lot of our webinars, you're never going to fit it all into a, a one hour sort of session. But it kind of highlights those sort of strands that we need to consider. And I think obviously at the moment we're all so focused on the safeguard and the well-being of our students that sometimes we might forget that actually we need to safeguard ourselves as well and in respect to sort of our social media presences and so forth and there could be something over summer that we look to, to kind of address. Matilda is um, a really interesting film it's one that my sister was obsessed with as a child and you watch it um, when I was younger and you just watch it as a film and as Abed rightfully said these films sort of get sport and you almost think you could do a CPD session alone on just simply watching Matilda and writing down and discussing all of the issues and some which are less obvious than others. So what we're going to do, I want to welcome Abid, Rabia and Simon to the East stage. So, uh, they'll be on in just a second. And we'll jump straight into the questions. I see quite a few questions have come up already. Abid, are we there? Yeah. Uh, Hi, James. Hi. Hello, everyone. Hello. How are we doing? Doing really well. Thank you very much. Hope you're Excellent. well. Good. We're good. We've got quite a few questions coming in. I think um, a really good place to start, because I think it's probably going to be a question that is at the forefront of everyone's mind. It, it, it's Pfizer's question. Uh, looking at how we're planning to manage student wellbeing and needs in September when we return back to school. I think that's a really sort of 
poignant sort of thing that I think is going to be on everyone's minds at present. Yeah, no, definitely. It's really, really interesting. Um, thank you for asking that question. And to be honest, it is, it's one of these questions that everyone at the moment is thinking about. Um, Simon's PowerPoint, as you would have seen, his section actually covered that. So Simon, if it's all right, can I pass that one over to you? How are you planning to manage student mental well-being needs in September or when we return indeed? Yeah, of course, that's absolutely fine. Um, I think I'll start by saying that nothing's annoyed me more during this pandemic than hearing this phrase that's been rolled out by various organisations and businesses around we haven't been given enough time to open or haven't been given enough time or notice to do whatever. And I find that incredible. I find that absolutely amazing. As I alluded to in, in what I was saying, the planning started before we closed. And, and, and I think that's, that's where we've been slightly ahead of the game and, and trying to stay ahead of, of whatever's put our way. And it's not just having one plan, it's having several. Because as I also said, we don't know what September's going to look like. We don't know. Uh, face coverings is a prime example. Mm -hmm. A few days ago, the government was saying, no, you don't need to wear them and schools won't need them. Now they're saying, yes, you do need them in public. Where's that going to leave schools? It's, it's, it's a very fluid time and we just don't know what, what's coming our way. In relation to actually managing the student wellbeing, uh, that's clearly top of our list. And, and we need to know what the stress levels of our children are and the anxiety levels. And we can only really do that by sitting down with them on one to one. Now, that, that sounds amazing for a school that's got potentially about 1,100 students in it. But the aim, the ideal, will be to manage those students individually with conversations through our pastoral team, through the safeguarding team, through teachers that we know certain children get on with, through the SEN team, through their skills and network, and really trying to gauge what we have coming through the doors in September. Because we don't know. We won't have seen a lot of these children for six months. We won't have had any proper interaction with some of these children for six months. It wasn't tongue in cheek when I said about making referrals, but we have to be, we have to acknowledge that a lot of these children, through no fault of theirs, have not had that motivation at home to carry on with their learning. And they've not necessarily had the shielding from the constant bombardment of news. I mean, we tell the adults, don't we, to, to, to limit how often you look at news, news throughout this, this pandemic. The children will be absolutely on that. And the problem they have, they haven't necessarily got the maturity of thought to think through actually let me rationale what I'm, what I'm looking at, what I'm reading, what I'm hearing. And, and then there's the classic two and two makes five and they have a situation in their mind. You know, I think back to when I was growing up um, and there was talking of, of the, the nuclear problems and, and threat level. And as a child, I thought it was very real. I thought it was going to happen. How far away as a world we were from that happening, who knows? But as a child, you think it's going to and all, this, all the, the concern and the worry that goes around that. So, we're very much still in the planning stage, but that planning is not just plan A. I mean, I know for a fact, I, I don't sit on the SLT, but I know that they have been sitting every day mm -hmm. and their plans are changing. Um, but they have a slight guesswork here, but plan A, B, C, D and E, because we just don't know what we're going to do. So contingency planning is key. So it's very much when September arrives, this is what September looks like. So the best plan we have for that is maybe plan F. We'll take that down off the shelf and we'll run with that. And if in a week's time it needs to change, then we can change. Equally, not just speaking with the children, we need to be speaking with parents and not just the, the parents of children that are on any of the vulnerable lists, but in general. Mm -hmm. And I think Abid touched on that in his part of the presentation. Language is a big barrier mm -hmm. and the understanding created by that is a big barrier. And we're blessed at this school of having many, many staff that are able to communicate with the community in the languages that are needed. So it's very mindful that that has to take place as well. There's no point in me just sending out something if, if half of our parents are going to struggle to understand the deeper meaning or the basic meaning of what I'm trying to say to them. So I think in, in summary, it's a bit of an unknown still, but the idea is that we will sit with our children, with our students. We will gauge through them, hopefully on one-to-ones, because not everybody wants to speak out in a group. And we will slowly, within the first month back at school, being realistic, it's not going to happen in the first couple of days, mm -hmm. but over that first month back, we will look at how our children are, whether we have the right capacity and skill level in school within the pastoral team and others to cope with that, or whether perhaps we need to consider buying in some specialist help if that's what we think is needed. So I hope that answers the question. I hope it wasn't yeah. waffled on too long. But no, uh, no, I think, I think it's quite comprehensive. I think, I think it is an appreciation for, um, and as you mentioned within the video, is we're all in this together. We're all at the same point. We're all experiencing this for the first time. 
And so we are going to need to adapt and kind of learn on the go. And like I said, assess that situation and, and have contingency plans in place and make the best of what options we have available to us. Um, and, I, and, I, and I think, you know, it, it, it is going to be a challenge to kind of reach out to everyone, both parents and students. But it's something I think that like, we all need to be making sure that we're doing. And like you say, it's the challenge that we're all going to face in school. Mm-hmm. And it's a real, going to be a real team effort, I think, rather than, you know, people relying um, so heavily on you know, the, the, the safeguarding teams that each school have. Absolutely. Just, just on that point, I, I, I noticed that, that, you know, Simon finished off with talking about communities. There's another really inquest, interesting question that's coming in the thread. It says, please outline how a school engages a disconnected community to ensure that it gets accurate and fruitful information about safeguarding issues outside of school. And I think this is really, really interesting. I'm going to try to ang- answer this from a few different angles. First of all, put my business studies hat on. Important to conduct a SWOT analysis. So, you know, look at what are within the community and where we're working, our context, what are the strengths? You know, identify the strengths that we already, already have with the community. Uh, what are the perceived weaknesses? Are there any opportunities that we need to explore? And, and most importantly, I think, Simon, you touched on this, the threats, and one of them may well be barriers. I know when it comes to working with the community, depending on where you are and depending on your setting, there are some settings where there may well be more barriers than others. Simon also touched on that communication barrier. I'm hoping that you, you've seen in, in the video that we put together, the really important safeguarding message that went out uh, in Urdu, in Bangla, and in English. And I think that was really, really important for us because here in our setting, we need to adapt and we need to put in practices that suit our cohorts and also suit our parents because that's a really, really important aspect. Touching on local communities, it's, it's interesting to see that depending on where your school setting is, it really depends on the community organizations that operate outside your school. Um, for example, local youth clubs. How closely are you working with local youth clubs and, and leaders from those youth clubs? Faith leaders, that's an interesting one. A lot of our students will have interaction with certain faith groups. For us, if we make a concerted effort to make sure that we have those partnerships in place uh, so that we know what our students are facing when they leave school as well, what's going on in the weekend. And that for us as a safeguarding team is really, really important. So I would say engaging organizations like local youth clubs, look at your setting, are you, are you engaging them? Faith leaders, a, a huge asset for us is, is our local community policing team. And how closely are you working with them? The reality is that the local community policing team they are a huge asset. They have a lot of information in terms of what's going on out there in the different pockets that we're serving. So again, that engagement level, you can ask yourself as a school, how much work are you doing with the community team? So again, I think when when it comes to this particular question and and trying to engage a disconnected community, we really need to try to figure out why is it disconnected? What are are the barriers? I think with anything, relationships are always built on trust. So again, you have to ask yourself, what steps are we taking as an organization to build that trust, you know, so that people will report things to us so that we can follow up. We know there are certain communities that when it comes to safeguarding issues, they like to take care of things themselves outside of school. And that happens in certain communities. It causes a problem for us as a safeguarding team because then we're often having to pick up the pieces, things that may well have happened in the community. And if we're unaware of them, it poses a a challenge for us because sometimes we have to pick up the pieces. So, if we have that connection, if we have those uh, partnerships in place, it makes our job a lot easier because we know what the students are facing inside of school, but more importantly, we know what they're facing when they leave the school gates. We know what's going on in the holidays. We know if there's an issue in a particular organization or a youth club, uh, it might be, I don't know, it might be a weekend football game, and they may, something may have happened at that football game, and then that manifests into a problem and, and that might come into school. Now, if we have those connections in place and those partnerships in place, it really puts us in, in, in a strong position. Um, I hope that answers some of that question. Uh, the, an- another interesting question came in from a colleague on the third day. It was looking at how a school, how can a school ensure staff are protected when using social media for the right reasons? Rabia, I'm going to hand that one over to you if that's okay. Yeah, sure. That's a really, really good question. Um, in terms of social media, we need to really be looking at, do we have a policy that reflects that in school? I think that would be the starting point. Um, we often have things around IT and use of technology, um, but we don't have sometimes um, policies which are specific to social media and their use. Um, again, it's about if you do have that, uh, revisiting it regularly. We know how fast technology moves, um, so it's important that those policies reflect those changes as well, so we're not left behind. 
and also not just leaving it there at the policy, but how does that feature in terms of your training that you deliver throughout the year, you know, in staff training days and, and what have you, um, and discussions with other staff, whether it's sort of smaller cohort, specific year group, um, staff tutors. And again, not just leaving it there, it's really important to continue drip feeding that mm. information, reminding staff about the importance, because we can all become, like I mentioned, complacent. Mm -hmm. Social media is very much everyday part of our lives. And, um, you know, often the lines are sort of blurred when we're at work, when we're, you know, using our personal phones and um, work phones and things like that. So it's important to really adhere to sort of those strict boundaries and also preempting that. So, for example, in our school, uh, we know that our P department, they'll get, they're going to have fixtures. Mm. There's going to be lots that they want to tweet about or promote on social media. Um, so if you know that um, in our school, what we've done is we've given the P department their own phone um, specifically for that use. Um, so you can prevent anyone sort of not trying to sort of miss an opportunity where they can promote and celebrate uh, the school's achievements, um, but do that in a safe manner. Um, and I think it's also important to... Um, just again, just continue, continually revisiting that throughout the year um, and not leaving that. And again, by doing that, you, you'll find situations like, for example, the PE department, uh, where you can actually help them support and preempt it and just prevent it um, from a safe body perspective. Yeah, but I, I think yeah. that's looking at things from a starting point of view. That's a brilliant point. But we know social media, I mean, look, let's, let's turn this around and look at it from a student's perspective. You know, social media is incredibly powerful. There's so much information out there. However, Sometimes what we find in schools is that a lot of the issues that are going around somehow, some way, they, they may link to social media. So for us as, as professionals, as practitioners, it's really, really, really important for us to ensure that we are up to date with what's going on out there. And we know it's a changing landscape, you know, with technology evolving, moving. There are so many apps out there. Honestly, there are apps that, you know, sometimes I'll come across, I'll, you know, on a safeguarding network, uh, a message will go out and they say there's an issue with this particular sort of uh, app. And I'll read it and I think, actually, I've never come across the app in my life, you know? So again, for us, it's, it's, it's an area that we constantly need to put energy into because we know it has a lot of benefits, but it also has a lot of harms. And, and talking about the harms, you know, one of the points we mentioned in, in our presentation was the fact that this is something that needs to be embedded throughout the curriculum. So do our students understand the safeguarding issues that arise with, with things like social media, for example, we know cyberbullying is, is, is on the rise. So again, as a school in any setting, probably worth looking at the whole school curriculum and then trying to figure out whether there are opportunities where we can maybe slip that in. Things like assemblies are perfect examples because we know that nowadays a lot of young people are facing issues and backlash on social media. Sometimes it may well be a, a really minor argument, uh, you know, that's, that's happened on social media and then it just takes one person to screenshot, share it, and then before you know it, that opens up a can of worms and you've got a huge, huge issue that the pastoral teams are diving into. So from, from our point of view, from uh, as professionals, as, as people working in safeguarding, we need to ensure that our knowledge is up to date. We need to know which platforms our young people are using, what's popular. Uh, you know, there, there may be a certain setting where, you know, WhatsApp might be really popular, WhatsApp groups, and, and there may be issues uh, that are creeping up through that. We've got other, other things to think about, like the PlayStation Network. A lot of young people on the PlayStation Networks they have the accessibility and availability to speak to people online. So again, in terms of the, the sort of online aspect, there are a lot of issues within that to unpack. So as a school, maybe look at the curriculum and think to yourself, are there opportunities where we can sort of explore this area in a lot more detail? Uh, so right. anything you want to add to the sort of social media side in, in your experience? No, I, I just think it's... Um, you, you... Sounds awful to say you can't necessarily rely on, on common sense. Sometimes people do need to be educated, and that's that's adults as well as children. And uh, yeah. I've I've seen some in in previous walks of life I've been in. I've seen some horrendous results of of misuse, not through any 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 um, unknown reason, but just the misuse of social media and the impact it can cause in the community. Uh, so I think I just echo the words that it's it's that drip feed. It's it's like the safeguarding culture. It's like everything that's embedded into the school. If it's drip fed constantly, then it goes in subliminally or otherwise, but it's going in. And, and therefore, when people then retrieve that information, um, when we look at how we, we ensure that our staff understand that, it's through constant, constant reminder, constant revisiting, constant retrieval of that information. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I just really echo what Abid said. It, it's, it's a danger, but it can be made to work very positively. And that's what we should focus on and just understand that there is a side to it that we need to educate people about.
Yeah, yeah I, th I think I think it's a crucial sort of couple of points, obviously, that uh, we think about it with safeguarding uh, and e-safety and, and all, all of those sort of elements that it's not a, I've attended a one day training session and I've got a certificate and now, and now I'm able to keep things safe in a school and, you know, we'll all probably come back into schools in September and have a training day and we'll have kind of the statutory sort of safeguarding bits and pieces within that. But like we say, it is that continual sort of development over the course of time. And it's not the fact that someone sat and watched this webinar today. You know, it is that this is a start point. This is a conversation. And as Simon, I think you mentioned as well, that the points in your presentation were there to provoke thought rather than the answers to some of the problems. There was a question that came in and I kind of want to go to it, but I want to add a little bit to it as well. Um, so from Jessica, so what happens, uh, sorry, from Jessica, how can teachers who have mental health problems uh, be supported when they find it hard to support students? So we've spoken a quite a bit about the support that we're providing for students, but we need to equally be aware that we're working in schools with 100 plus members of staff who also will have experienced potentially the same losses and the same challenges that our students have faced. And obviously having been now out of the classroom for a number of months, you know, particularly things like people like NQTs as well, that are going to be coming in having only effectively had half a year's worth of training. So from a safeguarded perspective, what is it that we can do as schools to, pro uh, to provide support? Uh, uh, yeah. I think it's a brilliant question because it's, some, it's one that affects pretty much everyone that's been through lockdown. I mean, if we, if we look at this from a sort of trauma lens, we know that the young people, our students, who we've been keeping in touch with, you know, we've been trying to engage throughout the lockdown, we know that depending on the student and their home circumstances and things like their family set up, we know it's a different experience for everyone. For, 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 most, for most students, and I'll, I'll come on to the staff side of it, for most students, it may well be the most traumatic thing they've ever been through in their entire life. And we know as professionals, we're already trying to put in plans uh, in, in terms of trying to accommodate that and trying to be in a position where we have the sort of, the sort of focus to at least catch up with every single student one-on-one. -on -one. Because, you know, we know if we talk about these things in a, in a group setting uh, within the bubbles, we know there are some students that are quite introvert and they probably won't put their hand up and say, Do you know what, Mr. Khan, yeah, I've had, had issues. I've, you know, I've really struggled. Some of them will just nod and say, that's fine. I'm absolutely fine. That, you know, everything's okay at home. We also know if we speak to them privately uh, and, you know, have those sort of one-to-ones, sometimes we can gauge a lot more. And I'd use the same technique with staff. It, you know, it's, it, it's fine if you're in a, most, most organizations, they may have, I don't know, a WhatsApp group for certain for subject areas. On a, on, on a group like that, if you say, how's everyone doing? Are you all okay? you're probably going to get loads of thumbs up. But again, taking that time out to speak to people one-on-one -on -one and really find out how they're doing. Um, I know if, you know, if, if someone was to sit with me and, and, and really ask me how I've been, you know, ask me about how, how homeschooling has been with, with my two lads at home, I'd probably go into a lot more detail. And then from there, you know, in terms of the, any issues that I might have, I'd be comfortable in sharing them because I, I know that someone genuinely asking me about myself, my family, my situation. So, you know, there's that aspect of it, that sort of, that, that sort of um, human touch and making sure that you're, you're putting these things uh, in place and, and giving people that time. So can I? Yeah, of course. Yeah, but I, I mean, I've taken phone calls from staff over the, the, the time we've been out of school. Um, and I think that's indicative. That shows the, the community we have in school, that people are trusting enough that you all listen to what they say. I mean, it's the classic, don't bother asking someone how they are in the morning if you don't want to hear the answer. Because everybody says, yeah, I'm fine. But actually, you know, that's not, no one's ever fine um, without being too gloomy. Mm -hmm. um, but if you don't want to hear the answer, don't bother asking the question. We mentioned about the, the staff wellbeing survey. Um, I'm keen that we revisit that when we get back in September and see how people are then and probably revisit again post half, half term. And so trying to capture quite a close idea of where people's mental, mental well health and well-being is. But I think we're quite blessed. I, I believe we have a, a culture in school and, and a team that know they can talk and will be listened to. That would be very difficult if you worked in an environment where you thought no one is going to listen to me. That would become really hard. So I can only really speak from here to say that we're not blase about it. We don't wrestle our laws. And some people will need a little bit of, of um, support. And, and some people just won't want to discuss it. And that's fine, and we have, to, we have to respect that and acknowledge that. But that doesn't mean that we can't keep our eyes open and we can't see and, and, and understand or empathise with issues that people have had. Um, so it's very much, very, as I've been touched on, it's similar to the children. It's going to be a case with the staff, and again, that's in the planning stage as to who that is, how it's offered, 
whether it's offered to external agency, whether it's offered by staff in school, but to sit with your peers and to find out where people's concerns sit. Um, so I, 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 we're very mindful of it. And that's yeah. why I come back to saying that nothing annoys me more than hearing, oh, I haven't been given enough time to think about that. Mm -hmm. uh, that's absolute rubbish. Even without this, you think about your staff's well-being. Yeah. Um, and so we, we've, we've had things throughout the year for the staff on training days around mindfulness and well-being. Mm -hmm. So it's something that's starting to embed, that is embedded and starting to embed deeper in school already. Um, so. Yeah. I think it really comes down to, again, that you can't pour from an empty cup and the staff being your most valuable asset, um, it really is important to like, reinvest. And again, just to echo what Simon said about culture being very important, you can have all the resources, you can signpost staff to wherever and you know, make that known to them and, and, and give that information out. But again, it's that culture, if staff feel comfortable to be able to access that support, if it's already there and it's existing and it's developing and they feel you know, that, that sense of um, ease in order to talk to somebody else or know where to go, um, I think that's really crucial. Um, otherwise, staff can become more withdrawn. If they don't feel you know, comfortable with actually accessing that support which is available, um, it, it becomes redundant otherwise. Um, so again, I think it's really important. And it comes down, I think, as well, not just, I think, from the senior leadership team and then all the way through middle leaders and even through the safeguarding team. And then again, students feed off that as well. And I think um, if we model that behaviour and we make sure that, you know, for them to be aware of actually, it's okay to act as, you know, support, support is there for you to be there to utilise, especially working in an all boys school and, and normalising that kind of attitude around that. Um, I think it works well for both staff and students. Brilliant. Yeah, I really like the idea that you can't pour from an empty cup. So we need to look after look after our staff so they can in turn look after our students as well. I reckon we've got time if we're very quick for one more question. Uh, James, sorry, you know, just on the question, there's a really, really interesting question. I wanted to tackle a bit earlier. I think this is more of a sort of offset type of question. It says, uh, well, one of our colleagues on the thread has said, how can you evidence that all staff actually understand statutory guidance they sign off? And an example has been given here for keeping children safe in education. And we know what some amendments have been made to this, uh, and it comes into play in September. And I think that's a really, really important question. And for us, recently we had an offset visit, and this actually came up. Uh, the inspectors were really keen to know how we, as a safeguarding team, as a school, how do we know that staff actually understand uh, what they're signed? And again, it's one of these documents, you know, often a, a lot of schools, when, when these documents come out, some schools will upload on you know, platforms, maybe like uh, Policy Viewer, for example. And when it's on Policy Viewer, an email will be sent out. Staff will have a certain amount of days to read it. You scroll through it, tick, and it's had a timestamp. And then people say, well, I'll sign that. It's all sorted. And the question from, from Offset really was, well, how do you know that people actually understand what they've signed? And that, that's a really interesting one. I think that's one uh, that we can speak uh, through from experience, having recently been through Offset. I think it's important for this one to, to plan ahead and ring fence that CPD time and ensure that it's actually featured in your training program. So you can evidence that, you know what, these are the certain parts of the year that we actually look at safeguarding and these are the topics that we're looking at. And we can obviously time them with things like when addendums come out, for example. Um, and, you know, we may need to move some training back and bring safeguarding training forward and so on and so forth. Um, I think for this one, really, it's about having an ongoing discussion. You know, Rabia mentioned that constant drip feed, and it has to be there. It's a constant drip feed. It isn't, you know, we, we, we've signed it in September. We won't come back to it again now. Keeping children safe in education, you know, it's, it's, it's a huge document. There are so many different parts that we can pick up uh, and we can really discuss and, and try to put, put a bit of context around it. So that staff are in a situation where they can apply what's, what's in the booklet to our setting. Um, so again, the use of what is scenarios, really testing uh, the knowledge that staff have. And this is not to catch anyone out. If we're talking about cultures and we're talking about embedding cultures or safeguarding, we shouldn't be in a situation where anyone is feeling kind of precious and thinking, Actually, I'm a bit nervous, I, you know, they're going to catch me out. No, it's not about that. It's about having open and honest discussions, looking at what is scenarios. Um, and, and the main point I wanted to make on this question was the fact that as practitioners, as, as, as teachers, within the classroom, we look at things like retrieval practice. You know, so when, when we're looking at our students and we want them to remember formulas and we want them to remember certain dates and historic events and for them to secure that knowledge, we look at our practice as professionals and we try to build in a bit of retrieval practice in the hope that if we do it properly, students will remember and it'll go into their long-term memory and hopefully they'll be able to recall that information when, when, when needed. Again, let's put the safeguarding hand on that. In your safeguarding teams, what kind of retrieval practice are you putting in? 
So, you know, in terms of the techniques you might be using, like, I don't know, um, if it's a, a crossword or a quiz or something that you're trying to do that's a bit interactive, it's a bit fun because, you know, we know statutory guidance is really, really heavy. Um, it's a lot to learn. What techniques are we putting in as a team? Are there any techniques we're putting in to, to give staff a, an opportunity to retrieve? Um, Simon, did you want to come down? I know before the break, you, you sent out quite a few quizzes and crosswords. Yeah, and I just think it's, um, you look at how children learn and, and often, sometimes you just got to learn things like dates, but sometimes you can learn through a bit of fun. And I think it was like that at the start of this. We never really knew how long this was going to go on for at the start. And so early doors, it was just sending out a bit of a fun crossword. And if you don't know the answer, go and look it up because the, the competitive bit kicks in amongst the staff and they want to complete their crossword. And by doing that, they've reminded themselves of, as I've, I've mentioned before, subliminally it goes in, drip fed it. it. It's just that constant little and often and, and, and the memory then stays with staff. Brilliant. Thank you guys. It's been a really, really informative session. We're going to wrap things up. So I just wanted to say thank you, Simon, Rabia, Abid. It's been fantastic. Really, really informative. Whilst I'm wrapping it up, if you, there's any questions you want to type answers out to, um, feel free to do so. Um, and I know that you guys are pretty active on Twitter as well. So if, if uh, any of the attendees want to reach out, then uh, I'm sure they can do. So thank you for your time today. Many thanks, James. Thank, thank you, you, everyone. Thank Take you. care, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. No worries. So the penultimate session of the LD EduChat, this series coming to an end tomorrow. We've got Diana Osaji. She's leading on courageous leadership. And I know that Arv's been sort of quite pressing of that being a big session. So uh, please, please, please do join us again tomorrow. Um, just to remind you, as with all of our sessions, they are recorded and will be uploaded to our YouTube channel page. Uh, if you look at the Chiltern Teaching School Alliance on YouTube and at Chiltern TSA on Twitter, if you want to get involved in any of the conversation. James Self signing out for the penultimate session. We'll catch you guys tomorrow. Have a good day.